welcome everyone to Catalan Poetry in English, an Unexpected Trend. 20 books of Catalan poetry in English have been published in the last five years in the United States and in the United Kingdom. So if it's a trend, as our title suggests, then the Institute Ramon Lull has uh, contributed significantly to it. The Institute's international mission is to promote Catalan culture. This does not exclude Catalan poetry, I'm glad to say. So to achieve this goal, among its many other activities, the Institute supports the training of translators, many of whom I'm happy to say are in our audience tonight. Today, I should say, it feels like night. Um, next year's London Book Fair in 2022 will spotlight Catalan literary translation into English. There will be professional programs uh, consisting among other things of meetings between Catalan publishers and British publishers and agencies of Britain and the United States, and a program of events in the book fair and in different London locations. Um, the, advanced Catalan in to the, the Advanced Catalan to English Literary Translation course, which the Institute offers is part of the Spotlight uh, 2022 general program. Why have I been asked to uh, present this event or chair it at least? I'm a Mexican citizen. I may be the only Mexican in British publishing at the moment. And I am a poetry publisher at Carcanet Press with some Catalan authors already under our belts. Uh, I was responsible for bringing, uh, bringing out Luis Rodriguez's versions of Salvador Espriu's selected poems, Lawrence Venuti's translations of Ernst, uh, Ernst Fares's uh, Edward Hopper in Catalan and English, which was quite an interesting um, enterprise and went down quite well and Adrian Nathan West's translations of Pere Jean Ferrer, um, the Catalan poems in 2019. Carcanet, at the behest of the Scottish Poetry Library, published Anna Crow's vivid anthology, Lights of Water, 25 Catalan poems, 1978 to 2002. My magazine, PN Review, has been included a number of Catalan poets and translations and a lot of writing about Catalan poetry down the years. The important people here tonight, today, are the translators um, who've done all the hard work, all the heavy lifting. Oh, and the poets, of course. But the translators, I think, ought to be given substantial credit. There's a proper campaign on at the moment uh, to insist that the translators' names should be put on the covers and title pages of all the books that they translate, because in Britain there has been a, a kind of a habit to make the translator invisible. Um, a campaign, this is a campaign that I myself support as a translator myself and as a publisher. The important people here today are, as I say, the translators and, and of course, the poets. And we're very delighted to have two of the most talented and distinguished and delightful contemporary Catalan poets with us. What will happen now is that I will introduce first Sharon Dolan, who will present her poet, Gemma Gorga, and then I will introduce Anna Crow, who will introduce her poet, Manuel Forcano. You will see at the bottom of your screen that you have a chat box and you also have a Q&A box. Any questions you would like to direct to specific poets or to the, or, or to the assembled multitude of poets and translators, put in the Q&A, please. And any chat you would like to have amongst yourselves, telling us where you are, what, where, what, what your interests are and so on, please put in the chat box. The chat box is there for all the contributors to enjoy. So I very much hope you will contribute questions. At the end, there will be a chance for a Q&A. Um, each of the poet, uh, poet translator pairings will have about 22 to 22 and a half minutes to uh, present their work. And then uh, there will be time at the end for, for the questions. Um, they will talk as they, as they present their poems, they will talk to each other about the, the choices they've made about collaboration together and they will then read. I've suggested that they should read the English first and the Catalan second, because being ignorant of Catalan myself, I'm sorry to say, I would like to know what I'm going to hear and then hear it. Um, I hope I'm not being too colonial in this, in this um, proposal. Um, the event will last almost exactly an hour, I hope not over an hour, and um, we're very delighted that you can join us. So please listen enjoy and participate in the question and answers at the bottom of your screen. Um, now to the business of, that really matters. Um, please meet Sharon Dolan first. She has written six books of poems herself, most recently uh, 
Manuel, Manual for Living, published by the University of Pittsburgh Press in, in 2016. Um, her seventh book, Imperfect Present, not present imperfect, that's nice to see, it's a, it's a reverse tense, um, is forthcoming from the University of Pittsburgh Press as well. The translations of Gemma Gorga's book, book of Minutes in the Field Translation Series from Oberlin College Press in 2019 was supported by a pen and an Institute Ramon Lou Grant. She received in 2021 a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Translation, and she won the Melinda A. Markham Translation Prize for Late to the House of Words, Selected Poems by uh, Gemma Gorga. Published um, this autumn by Saturnalia Books, she also wrote a memoir, um, Hitchcock Blonde, available from Terra Nova Press, published last year. She lives in New York City, where she is associate editor of Barrow Street Press and directs writing about art in Barcelona. Sharon, it falls to you to introduce to us your author, Gemma Gorga. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, let me give you a brief introduction of Gemma Gorga. She is a poet who writes exclusively in Catalan, though she teaches medieval and Renaissance Spanish literature at the University of Barcelona. She is the author of seven books of poetry and two books of translation, as well as several scholarly books and two prose uh, memoirs. In a 2012 interview, Gemma summed up her poetics of discovery like this. For me, poetry is a tool that opens things up and excavates and a light that guides me into corners I don't know. Her poems often foreground language and individual words as the constituents of our experience. As she said in an interview, the dictionary is one of my inexhaustible sources of inspiration. Her poems are in turn metaphysical, only very occasionally autobiographical, and are always interested in the limits of language and in gesturing beyond words. So I'm going to open with one poem from Book of Minutes, which was mentioned that it was supported by Institute Raymond Yule. And um, it is really a um, diminutive book of hours. There are 60 of these prose poems, 60 minutes. And um, I'm going to read number 17, followed by Gemma, who will read it in the original Catalan. And it opens with a dictionary definition. Small hollow metal sphere with a little ball inside that causes it to resonate at the slightest movement. Like any other book, the dictionary is also written in the first person singular. Each page about me, every word written thinking of me, a definition for the indefinite, order for the disorder. I understood it while reading the entry for Jingle Bell, the entire universe resonating inside me like a little ball, as if I, too, were a metal sphere, bright and hollow. Hi, uh, everybody. Uh, very happy to be here sharing this evening or morning with you or night. I don't know. The poem in Catalan says, Esfera petita de metall, buida, amb una boleta a dins que la fa ressonar el més petit moviment. Com qualsevol altre llibre, també el diccionari està escrit en primera persona del singular. Cada pàgina parla de mi. Cada paraula ha estat escrita pensant en mi. Una definició per a la indefinició. Un ordre per al desordre. Ho he comprès mentre llegia l'entrada de Cascavell i l'univers sencer ressonava com una boleta dintre meu, com si jo també fos una esfera de metall, brillant i buida. I just wanted to say that the, the Book of Minutes was how I began translating Gemma Gorda's work, and I found them in Anna Crow's Six Catalan Poets when I was staying at GWAR, an international residence for artists in the Gracia district of Barcelona. 
And I was so captivated by the few prose poems that were there, as well as by the other poems, but I was particularly interested in the, in the Book of Minutes. And so I went in search of a copy of the book, and I realized the only way to read the entire sequence was to translate it. So in what I call a combination of love and chutzpah, because at the time I knew no Catalan, I decided I wanted to translate these poems and I contacted Gemma Gorga and she said very kindly, yes. And so I began to learn Catalan as well as to translate her poems. Um, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that, Gemma. Well, I, I totally identify with what you say I mean, I myself, as a translator, feel this love again for for this um, need of bringing that uh, poem that I love into my own language for myself as well as for the others. Yes, yes. yes. So um, I wanted to now move on to Late to the House of Words, the, the selected poems that just came out. These are all the poems in lineated verse, so it does not contain Book of Minutes within it. It has the other six volumes of, of, of Gemma's work. And I'm going to start um, with Mirror, Mirror on the Wall, which contains the title to this collection. We showed up late to the House of Words, now we grope our way downstairs as painful as vertebrae and search between the walls plastered shards for some living syllable, sister to bread and poverty, to bring to our lips, such as a name, a woman's name, the bone of a woman's name lost between the stones of these walls that once upon a time housed flesh inside and perhaps a jewel, a little box, a mirror you could ask, so many things. Diga'm, mirall. Vam fer tard a la casa de les paraules i ara baixem a les palpentes, escales adolorides com vèrtebres i busquem entre el que els sobra alguna síl·laba viva germana del pa i la penúria, per dur-nos els llavis. Com ara un nom, un nom de dona, l'os d'un nom de dona, extraviat entre les pedres d'aquests murs que un dia foren habitats carn endins. I potser un joiell, una capseta, un mirall a qui poder preguntar tantes coses. The next poem I think of as a kind of feminist erotic creation story, an alternative creation story, and it's called So Then She. With flour and water, she worked his body. With flour and saliva, she conceived, leaned, learned that with flour and both hands, you reach the secret pliability of matter. With flower and lips, she worked the man down to the unbearable elasticity of tenderness. Then slowly, she tasted his body, the bread that was his body, bread that fit as well in her hands as does light on earth. I aleshores ella... Amb farina i aigua treballava el seu cos. Amb farina i saliva concebia, inclinava, aprenia que amb farina i dues mans s'arriba al dúctil secret de la matèria. Amb farina i llavis treballava l'home fins a l'elasticitat insuportable de la tendresa. I aleshores lentament tastava el seu cos. El pa que era el seu cos, el pa que s'emmotllava tan bé a les mans com la llum a la terra. I want to read one poem which is uh, somewhat autobiographical, so you see the range of Gemma's work, and it's called Stones. If a voice could emerge from photographs the way a shadow or tenderness does, despite there being more vulnerable realities. I would hear once more my father explaining to me 
that before picking up a stone, I should roll it over with my foot or a branch to scare off any scorpions hiding underneath like dry thorns. But I didn't worry about it because being six years old was simple, as simple as dying. In either case, it's no more secretive than the air to inhale or not to inhale, as if the soul were filled with tiny alveoli that open and close. The first scorpion I ever saw was inside a book about the natural sciences, trapped forever between the severe pincers of time. Sometimes, though, books don't tell the whole truth, as if they didn't know or had forgotten on the way to the printer. Arachnid whose body is divided into an abdomen and cephalothorax. No mention was made of the sun burning the tongue, of fear, of the thorn piercing the neck. I didn't know then that words are enormous icebergs hiding under glacial waters much more than they show. Like the word scorpion. Now as the phone insistently rings, morning's harsh cry, as I awaken, turn on the light, bring my hand to its white plastic body that shines like a stone in the sun. As I pick it up and say, Yes, and someone says, you are dead. I just think about scorpions and what you wanted to tell me when you repeated, roll over the stones, please roll over the stones. Pedras. Si la veu pogués sortir a les fotografies, com hi surt l'ombra o la tendresa, tot i ser realitats més vulnerables. Sentiria un cop més el meu pare explicant-me que abans de collir una pedra cal fer-la rodolar amb el peu o amb una branca per espantar els escorpins que s'hi amaguen, com punxes seques. Mai no vaig preocupar-me'n, perquè tenir sis anys era senzill, senzill com morir-se. En tots els casos no hi havia més secret que l'aire, respirar-lo o no respirar-lo, com si l'ànima fos plena de diminuts alvèols que s'obren i es tanquen. El primer escorpí que vaig veure va ser el llibre de ciències naturals, atrapat per sempre entre les pinces severes del temps. De vegades, però, els llibres no expliquen tota la veritat, com si no la sabessin o l'haguessin oblidat camí de la impremta. Aràcnit, que té el cos dividit en abdomen i cefalotòrax. Res no hi deia del sol ardent a la llengua, de la por, de l'espiga travessada al coll. Jo no sabia llavors que les paraules són immensos i sabergs que oculten sota les aigües glaçades molt més del que mostren, com la paraula escorpí. I ara, mentre el telèfon sona insistentment un crit agut de matinada, mentre em llevo, encenc el llum, acosto la mà al seu cos blanc de plàstic que brilla com una pedra al sol, mentre el despenjo i dic sí, i algú em diu que ets mort. Jo només penso en els escorpins, en allò que volies dir-me quan repeties fer rodar les pedres, sisplau, fer rodar les pedres. The next poem is called Semantics and Nutrition. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite poems. It feels like it, it is a kind of Weltanschauung. It's a whole view of the world. The leaf falls to the ground and decomposes into smaller meanings. Moisture, pigment, lamina, oxygen, heat, light. The way someone spells out their full name to a stranger. Carbon dioxide. Nothing is lost along the way, neither its conversations with the night rain nor flying lessons given by birds. It all decomposes into smaller units directly assimilated by patient ants, the silent mouths of the forest. That's why the language of the wind also comes to be spoken underground. 
That's why worms try on wings and fly away, turned into butterflies. Everything is matter. Everything is transformed into flight when a simple leaf falls to the ground. Thank you. I think this is also one of my favorite. <laughs> Semántica y nutrició. Cau la fulla a terra i es descompon en significats menors. Humitat, pigment, làmina, oxigen, escalfor, llum. Com qui lletreja el seu nom sencer a un desconegut. A, ni, drit, car, bo, nic. Res no es perd pel camí. Ni les converses que ha mantingut amb la pluja de nit, ni les lliçons de vol que li han donat els ocells. Tota ella es descompon en unitats menors directament assimilables per la paciència de les formigues, les boques callades del bosc. És per això que l'idioma del vent arriba a parlar-se també sota terra. I és per això que els cucs se'n proven ales i surten volant convertits en papallones. Tot és matèria, tot es transforma en vol quan una simple fulla cau a terra. The next one is called In Alphabetical Order, and it was probably my most creative bit of translation because it's playing with the dictionary and the order of words in the dictionary. And of course, the order of words in another language in English is not the same as that in Catalan. So I had to, um, I had to really um, be faithful to the order of words and sometimes change the, the meaning of the words in order to do so, especially in the final line. In alphabetical order, I leaf through the dictionary at random. Who has planted calendula next to calendar? Lilies by the lintel of the page. Words shed their shoes as they should to celebrate the Sabbath. Trenchant is not that far away from trenches, nor is mortality from marble, nor leaves from lead, which makes them fall beyond their meaning. I pass my fingers over the dusty spines of memory and search for a rule that lets me order the disorder. Please tell me, under which letter do I need to look for you? Yarrow, yaw, yop, you. I'll just say that the final you is the homophone Y-E-W, uh, which does not exist in the Catalan. But again, I was very constrained by the letter Y. There aren't that many words in English that begin with the letter Y. And I had to because of you. Um, it's much easier to begin with a T, too, and, and to move on from there. So all of those words are translated differently. But I wanted to foreground the you in the poem because I think that's important. I'm also, I, I'm, I'm about to say sorry, because <laughs> when I wrote this poem, I, 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 I didn't think of the translator. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. <laughs> But I can imagine how difficult this might have been to translate. Yeah, playing with, the, with these words. Per ordre alfabètic. Fullejo el diccionari a l'atzar. Qui ha plantat calèndules? al costat dels calendaris, lliris, els llindes de la pàgina. Es treuen les paraules, les sabates, per celebrar com cal el sàbat. La tristesa no és tan lluny de les trinxeres, ni la mort del marbre, ni les plomes del plom que les fa caure enllà del significat. Passo els dits pels lloms polsosos del record i busco un criteri que em permeti ordenar el desordre. Voldràs dir-me, sisplau, per quina lletra t'hauré de buscar a tu, tul, tulipa, tumul, turment? Ok. I think I'm going to have us, um, just looking at the time, have us close with two poems from Gemma Gorga's last book, um, The Agile Centre, Voyage to the Centre. And um, 
these poems, I wanted you to get a sense of them, how minimalist they are and how much they gesture towards the Lords that are not there. And um, the first one is called Hospitality of the Blank Page. And here too, I changed something to be more faithful to the sound over the sense. And I can talk about that afterwards if somebody is interested. Hospitality of the Blank Page. Since there are too many of us creatures for so little love, I put the word in the lock and beckon angels and flies, gods and bumblebees, nettles and petals to come inside with me and occupy democratically this new home of empty lungs. L'hospitalitat de la pàgina en blanc. Perquè som massa criatures per a tan poc amor. Poso la paraula al pany i convido àngels i mosques, déus i borinots, ortigues i orquídies a entrar-hi amb mi, a habitar democràticament aquesta nova casa de pulmons buits. And the final poem, which is the final poem in, the, in, this, in this collection, is, is also one of my favorites. Um, it, because it's, it's, it's kind of carving away at the language, as you'll hear. It's called Decreation. Learn from crabs the peaceful art of going backwards. Learn to unlearn. Go shoeless. Digress. Surprise yourself yet again. Look at an apple until you liberate it from the fine dust of allegory. Know nothing about what you should know. Forget artificial rhetoric and the boring mechanics of the atom. Look without saying, I am looking. Love without saying, I am loving. Leave verses unfinished. Leave verses Leave. De creixement. Aprendre dels crancs l'art pacífic d'anar enrere. Aprendre a desaprendre. Descalçar-se, desviar-se, sorprendre's i de nou sorprendre's. Mirar una poma fins a alliberar-la de la polsina de l'alegoria. No saber res del que s'ha de saber. Oblidar la retòrica sintètica i la mecànica avorrida de l'àtom. Mirar sense dir estic mirant. Estimar sense dir estic estimant. Deixar els versos inacabats. Deixar els versos. Deixar. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Michael. Thank you. That was a remarkably beautiful um, collaboration, if you like. It was wonderful to see the poet watching her poem come out in another language and watching the translator see her poem going back into its original. Really lovely. And um, I love the lines in the Scorpion poem about the book uh, that, that didn't know or had forgotten on its way to the printer. Stunning, stunning uh, locution there. A really, really wonderful meeting. Thank you both so much. We now move on to our second pair of readers. Um, Anna Crow is a poet and a translator. In 1998, she momentously, and that's my, that's my um, adverb, uh, co-founded Stanza, Scotland's still astonishing international poetry festival, and she was the artistic director for the first seven years, a huge achievement. Uh, her work has been recorded for the Poetry Archive and translated into several languages. By the way, I was interested, uh, I was interested how, um, how our our uh, Catalan poet in the last in the last pairing had translated into Catalan herself, and I'm I'm wondering if all Catalan poets are also translators into their language. Um, Anna's work um, uh, has been published in three full collections. Most recently, not on the side of the gods, which Ark brought out in 2019. The Scottish Poetry Library and Carcanet, thanks to dear Robin Marsak, published Light Off Water, an anthology of Catalan poetry, which I mentioned earlier, wonderful book. And with the Edinburgh Book Festival, she published Territories, poems and translations by three Innu and three Scottish poets. Her Mariscat Press chapbook, Figure in a Landscape, won the Callum MacDonald Memorial Prize and was a Poetry Book Society choice. 
It was translated into Catalan and published in Mallorca by Enciola and into Spanish by Pedro Serrano. Uh, she's the English translator of the late Catalan poet, Joan Margarit. Uh, Tugs in the Fog was a PBS <laughs> Society recommended translation in 2006. And Blood Axe will publish the fourth volume, Wild Feature, later this month. She's translated five titles from Catalan and Spanish for ARC. Manuel Forcano's Maps of Desire was the Poetry Book Society recommended translation in 2019. Over to you, Anna. I'm so pleased to see you again. Thank you very much, Michael. It's lovely to be here and lovely to see Manuel there. Well, I shall, I shall um, introduce Manuel to you. He is uh, one of, Bus one of um, Catalonia's leading poets and has become renowned as a great love poet. He's a Hebrew scholar with a doctorate in Semitic philology um, from Barcelona University, where he taught Hebrew, Aramaic, and the history of the ancient Near East. He's the author of, I think it's 10 now, collections of poetry, um, among which uh, we could mention Corinth, Corinth, Comun Persa, like a Persian, which won the Giovanni Tivoli Prize for the best European poet under 36. Ye de Strangeria, Immigration Law, Ciencia Exacta, Exact Science, and the latest one is Atokar, which we might translate perhaps by close by. I've not yet had the pleasure of reading that, but I hope to soon. He's been awarded many other uh, prizes, the Carlos Uriba Prize, the Jocs Florals de Barcelona Prize, the Critica Serrador, and other writings include books of historical essays, for example, A History of Jewish Catalonia and the Catalan Jews. He's himself a great tr prolific translator. He's translated Yehuda Amichai, Pinkar Sadeh, Ronnie Somek, Amos Oz, Ibn Battuta, Marco Polo, E.M. Forster, and he's also translated a Kabbalistic treatise called The Book of Creation, and much more. He used to work for Manuped in Aleppo to catalogue um, ancient manuscripts from around the Mediterranean. He's a former director of the Institut Ramon Yul, and he was the administrative director at the Center Foundation of International Early Music under the great Jordi Savai, whose 80th birthday we are actually celebrating this week on Radio 3, even as we speak. <laughs> I think, Manuel, you may, you may even have sung and played in, um, <laughs> and under uh, the master, possibly. I know you now live in Rabat, Morocco. I first read um, Manuel's poetry when ARC Publications, who are great publishers of poetry from around the world, always in parallel text, they asked me to translate the anthology that um, has already been mentioned, Six Catalan Poets, and Gemma, of course, was one, and Manuel was another. Ark decided to then bring out a whole book of his work, and so Maps of Desire was born and published in 2019. It was a huge pleasure and privilege to translate poetry of this order. Manuel's poetry is full of music, you'll hear it. His metaphors are extraordinary, the way they take you by surprise, with reversals of expected meaning. He wears his learning lightly as he explores in this wonderful book, all the meanings and landscapes of desire. I'll just hold up the book so you can see what a beautiful cover it is. Manuel, I think you asked a friend of yours if he would paint the, something for, for the, and this was the cover, he, he did it. That's, That's wonderful. Right. That's right, yes, yes. Well, um, without further ado, I'm going to read part of what is one of the great um, narrative poems in the book, 
the Baghdad train. This is a train journey from Aleppo to Baghdad, um, all through the desert um, when in the most terrible heat. Um, but Manuel brings it all to life and lots of ancient history pops up all the time. So here is part of the Baghdad train. The train was moving on through that desert landscape like a blind man's eye, with only here and there a rickety tamarisk, bushes with colorless flowers, spines with roots. And then suddenly, far off, the silhouette of the castle of Rahab. In the 11th century, the Abbasid prince Ibn Tauk built it tall and powerful, he said, as the waist of a lover. He kept the day on fire all night long with sumptuous feasts, torches, mirrors, silken cushions, and on the drums, the hands of Numidian slaves, odalisks with veils and sequins, fruit on gold and silver trays, overturned cups and laughter. Bodies like grapes that a hand presses. That it doesn't rain in the desert is a lie. The cries of joy that came from the banqueting hall made the windows swell, grow round. Outside, the guards on sentry duty up on the ramparts wept for envy. Suddenly, an earthquake. Not a cry, and the silence, and the same cloud of dust as now, suspended above the ruins. People search among the stones for pieces of those mirrors where joy remained engraves, engraved. Even now, we dream the pleasure of others. And now we'll hear Manuel read the original. Hi to everybody. Thank you very much, Anne, for this presentation. And thank you to hosting me this uh, evening. <laughs> That's the Catalan version. <laughs> Avançava el tren per aquell paisatge desèrtic d'ull de sec. Només s'allà un tamariu raquític arbustos amb flors sense color, espines amb arrels. I de sobte, al lluny, la silueta del castell de Rahab. Al segle XI, el príncep Abbasi de Ibentauk va construir-lo alt i poderós, va dir, com la cintura de la mant. Mantenia el dia encès tota la nit amb festes somptuoses, torxes, miralls, coixins de seda i els tambors, mans d'esclaus númides, odalisques amb vels i llantioles, fruita en safates d'or i argent, copes, volcades i rialles. Cossos com raïms que una mà es prem. Que no plou al desert és mentida. Els crits de goig que sortien de la sala de banquets feien més rodones les finestres. A fora, ploraven d'enveja els guardians que patrullaven pels marlets. De cop, un terratrèmol, cap crit, i el silenci i el mateix núvol de pols d'ara suspès damunt les runes. Hom cerca entre les pedres bocins d'aquells miralls on va quedar gravat el goig. Encara ara somiem els plaers dels altres. That phrase that we heard there, that it doesn't rain in the desert, is a lie is one that occurs again and again in this long poem. It's a kind of trope that brings it together, holds it together, and he explores all the different meanings of it um, to show that the desert is far from being a desert. Um, in, in this little piece that we've just read as well, um, I love the description of the banquets. And there was a a wider significance that I didn't completely appreciate at the time, 
about the, the windows growing more round. I, it was a very striking image and it's one that stayed with me. And then I realized um, that after the earthquake strikes, you have not a cry. And then further down in the poem, the silent river is likened to a speaking mouth. So I wondered perhaps these round, the windows that become rounder because of the cries, these are, in fact, speak. These are mouths, aren't they? I think, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I'd like now to read um, the beginning of not a very long poem, but um, not a short poem either. Beirut. Um, this is from the same collection um, as the Baghdad train. So this is Beirut, the opening lines. Somewhere in the body, we hide hatred in hands that caress, in the softness of lips, in the knees of those who prostrate themselves to pray, in the fingers of those who make the sign of the cross. And an entire city fits in the eye of a sniper as he takes aim in the vacant eye of a victim. Heaven hated the roofs and terraces and buried them. The windows spewed out rubble. Cellars swallowed people up. Only the sea was rescued from that shipwreck. But the ruined wheat comes back because there is no end to hunger. And now they are rebuilding the city with an eye to future devastations. Just like light, which from day fades into night and memory, at first so sharp in the mind, then later leeching color like a flag too long in the wind. Scaffolding, cranes, stone, and brick layers making cement. The buildings slowly grow, not knowing they will be rubble. And the wheat fields ripen, never knowing the sickle, nor what it means to be bred, so you may be eaten. Thank you, Anne. Beirut, en algun lloc del cos amaguem l'odi a les mans que acaricien, el tou dels llavis, els genolls dels qui es prosternen per pregar, els dits dels qui s'assenyen, i tota una ciutat hi cap a l'ull d'un franctirador que apunta, a l'ull buit d'una víctima. El cel odiava els sostres i els terrats i va enfonsar-los. Les finestres van vomitar la runa. Els soterranis van engolir la gent. Només el mar es va salvar d'aquell naufragi. Però reneix el blat cegat perquè no s'acaba mai la fam i ara reconstrueixen la ciutat amb vista a les devastacions futures. Talment la llum que de dia caurà en nit i el record primer vigorós a la memòria per després perdre el color com una bandera massa temps al vent. Vestides, grues, pedra i paletes fent ciment. Creixen a poc a poc els edificis sense saber quan seran runa. I els bladars maduren sense saber la fals ni què vol dir ser pa i que et masteguin. I think, of course, there's a... Now, after the great explosion in Beirut, there's a terrible irony in um, those lines about um, the, the, you know, the, the buildings not knowing, the buildings slowly grow, not knowing they will be rubble. That's terrible. Um, right. in, um, in this poem, especially, I think, um, I've noticed there, and I've noticed it in other poems too, you, ha you have uh, pairs of images um, placed like equal statements, one after another. And I wondered, it's almost 
it's a bit like the um, the structure of the Psalms. And I, I wondered if, if, if that was something you were aware of. This well, I don't, I don't know Anna, if I, if I was aware of that, but I used to read a lot of ancient poetry and especially ancient Hebrew poetry like the Psalms or, 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 or poetry of another cultures, uh, ancient cultures of Near East. And parallelism is one of the figures most used in this old uh, mm. and uh, ancient poetry. So maybe it's an influence mm. that appears mm. as well in my poems, fortunately. Mm. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. It's lovely, it's beautifully done. Um, you have um, you have it in, there's a wonderful poem of yours called Ibn Tulun, um, where this device is shown to tremendous effect in in the opening lines where it comes to me whilst climbing the spiral staircase of the cylindrical minaret of the Ibn Tulun Mosque. Tattooed on your body was a labyrinth from which I haven't yet discovered how to escape. I thought that was, a, it's just so, you, many of your metaphors and images are just so utterly astonishing and they're just, <laughs> So like a, Thank you, Anna. <laughs> a reversal of the usual order. I wonder, have we got time? Perhaps um, my, I, I think I think we have got time. I would love to read um, that beautiful poem that comes towards the end of the book called "That Light." Have you got a? Have you got it there, Manuel? Yeah. That light. That's terrific. So here we are. That light. As twilight slowly clothed our nakedness, this is what you told me. That you were from a village in the Punjab, land of the five rivers, all tributaries of the mighty Indus. That on their banks, men and gods had fought. That the brownness of your skin was from the mix of Indian and Persian that your ancestors went back as well to the Greek soldiers of Alexander, that your country had been ruled by generations of gurus and soothsayers, that the countryside was made of vast meadows all the way to the Himalaya, that on the summits the snows were everlasting, that in summer they were mirrors, that the light that light, and I saw it flashing in your eyes, immense. In the day's bright sun, I remember that night. <coughs> Aquella llum. Quan a poc a poc la penombra ens vestia la nuesa, això vas dir-me, que eres d'un vilatge del Punjab, al país dels cinc rius, tots tributaris del gran Indus, que a les seves ribes homes i déus havien combatut, que la teva bruno de pell era de la mescla d'indis i de perses, que els teus ancestres també se remuntaven als soldats grecs d'Alexandre, que el teu país l'havien governat generacions de gurus i d'endevins, que el paisatge era de prades immenses fins als Himàlaies, que als cims les neus eren perpètues, que a l'estiu eren miralls, que la llum, aquella llum, i jo la veia fulgurar els teus ulls, immensa. Sempre en el sol dels dies recordo aquella nit. has to be one of the most beautiful poems, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs> it, it, I love the, the richness of it, all the, and the, the feeling that, um, you know, that people have lived there for thousands and thousands of years, and we have such a wonderful mix in us of, from all over the place. It's just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's been a, a great pleasure and a privilege to work with you. And I hope we can do some more one day. Inshallah. We say here in Morocco, Inshallah. So. Inshallah. <laughs> the pleasure is mine and your translations are 
always, always very nice. And for me, I have to say that it's, um, I feel very, very fortunate, but because for a poet, it's an immense privilege that another poet will translate him because uh, it, all, it always, from poet to poet, it's, it's, it's the right way to be translated, I think. So thank you, Anne, thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Shukran, shukran. Thank you. <laughs> A wonderful experience. What was very strange is the contrast between Manuel and our first, our first Catalan poet. I mean, they could not have been more different. It's, it's, it's such a, a range. But listening to the translation, Anna, I was, I was, um, I, with the last poem in particular, I listened to your first line. And I thought that's iambic pentameter, and then I listened to Manuel's reading, and it was exactly right. It seemed to me that maybe Catalan um, is a less, uh, a less polysyllabic language than, than the, the Spanish that I speak. Uh, it seems to be much more accommodatable, if you like, in, in there's a polysyllabic word, um, uh, in English. I, I do, do you find this? Um, Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, it has so many monosyllabic words and it's strongly consonantal as well. And mm. so it, we, it seems as though you can very readily find the right sonic equivalence in English. I think it, it's, 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 it, always surprises me and you know fills me with pleasure how quickly you can you can you know get the get the music to say keep mm -hmm. the same music of it in the english yeah yeah yes i think it's ve it's so different from spanish uh, mm -hmm. and we're, we're from hungry. french too golly yes. mm -hmm. <laughs> we're hungry for your questions but i have a couple more questions one one was provoked by sharon's uh, aside when she was talking about the occasionally the sound takes over from the sense or the, the sound is more important than the sense so something which I responded to very warmly I just wanted you want to you said you might expand on that Sharon um sure I I'll just give you the example in hospitality of the blank page one of the poems that I read there is a line there um ortigas y orchidias which would be nettles and orchids. But I felt that the sound was the more important thing in those two words. They just are so close together that I decided to go for nettles and petals because I wanted to preserve, you know, so I still have a flower, but I, it's, it's a more generic flower, of course, but I wanted to preserve the sound. And it's such a minimalist poem that seemed really important to me. And um, the same was true in alphabetical order where um, uh, we don't have, you know, sabatas and sabat, you know, we have, it's much closer in sabat in, in, in Catalan, whereas in English, we have um, shoes and the Sabbath. So I had to use a lot of alliteration um, mm. around shoes, words shed their shoes so they should. So that's how I could get in the sound quality mm. um, because I didn't think I should switch it to sandals. That didn't seem right to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so those are, those are some examples where I had to, I had to play with the, the sound um, to get in the same quality that I found in the original. Mm -hmm. Gemma, how do you feel when you hear um, petals instead of orchids? Orchids, is that right? The only reason I ask that is that orchid seems to carry a particular kind of uh, charge, which is not there in petals, or not, certainly not in the same ex to the same extent. Okay, I, I mean, Sharon is so respectful and is so faithful that I I give her all the credit. So. I tried, as, as being translated, I tried not to interfere too much. I completely trust in, in her work. And as a result, I mean, that sounds so good. That, um, that goes beyond the literal um, faithfulness. And so she, she can go deeper doing these uh, little twists little changes, which I completely agree, yeah. Are you ever tempted to revise the, the Catalan poem in the light of the translation? I, I know some poets who have been translated have brought back from the translation some new, some new um, learning. What do you think, Manuel? <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I I think it's always interesting that the versions, the translated versions are, are new poems sometimes. So mm -hmm. I think it's very important to 
to give the translator the, the freedom to choose the poems that, that, that he, want, he want to translate. I remember when I prepared the anthology of Yoda Mihai, and uh, I asked him, in, uh, once he came to Barcelona for a festival, I asked him, I, I, have, I have chosen these poems, but I don't know if you would like that I will translate another poem or, or a poem that you expect that I would, could translate for the anthology. And he told me, no, 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 no. You choose the poems because you have to know which poems you can best translate. So I think the freedom, the freedom of the, the translator is very, very important. But uh, I see that Sharon uh, decided to translate a very difficult poem. And she worked very, very hard to translate it and wonderfully, wonderfully. So uh, congratulations, Sharon, because it's Thank a hard you. work to translate this poem of Gemma. It's quite difficult. I think, well, uh, I think the poem that, that like that, I, I would... I would, <laughs> I would avoid. <laughs> you mean in alphabetical order, that particular poem? Yes. I yeah. Um, well, I felt like I could be more creative there. And as a poet, of course, I like that. Um, because again, I had to preserve that alphabetical order and change some of the words. So um, whereas you have um, plomas del plom, you have feathers is not that far from lead. Um, I had to turn it into leaves from lead, but then I had this lovely double entendre at the end, which makes them fall. And so you have that sense of falling and also the, the season of the fall with leaves. So there are different resonance that, that come through in the translation. But for me, that's, that's fun. That's an opportunity to be creative. I love the word fun. I must say that uh, whenever one does translate it, it, it can be fun, can't it? And when it's not fun, you should probably turn the page. Um, you, both of you, Gemma and, and Manuel, you've, you've both done translations into Catalan, I assume, have you? Yes. And um, have you done contemporary poetry from, say, English into Catalan, or what have you tried? You, Manuel, yours has to, have to do with your academic studies, but have you also done contemporary poetry? No, I always translate... Uh, when it's poetry, I translate always from Hebrew, Hebrew poetry. And uh, sometimes I translated some English, one or two English poems and French poems. But but when it's real poetry that I want to translate is from Hebrew. Into, and, Catalan. Uh, into Catalan or into Spanish? Into Catalan always, always okay. into Catalan. Yeah, so yeah, both always. you and Gemma, you also just work only in Catalan, is that right? Yes, though, though I, I'm not a, a professional translator. I just oh, translate for love, so... Oh, me, me too, me too. Me? It's only love, it's only love. <laughs> but it's like me being a publisher, I don't, I don't publish for money, let me tell you. It's, it's love. <laughs> love. <laughs> yes, I think that's... that's so, so, yes, I, I, I translated uh, two contemporary Indian poets writing in English. One is uh, Dilip Chitre. And then I co-translated with Ernest Farres. I uh, we translated Edward Hirsch. Uh -huh. mm. We used to publish Edward Hirsch. He he was he translated you, didn't he, um, uh, Gemma? Who? Did me? Eddie Hirsch translate you as well in the states? Did you did he collaborate in translating you? Oh, no, actually, oh, no. no. Actually, Edward. Um, I mean, we we. Mm, made some questions, but uh, very few things. I mean, uh -huh. yeah. Well, we're nearing very ne nearly at the end of our time. Um, I, I must say this has been, a, for me, a wonderfully illuminating uh, hour. And uh, it's so wonderful to meet Catalan poets of such extraordinary talent and vividness and to have two such wonderful, wonderful translators. I thank you so much. I'm grateful to the, to the Institute for bringing us all together and for bringing us into an audience full of, full of translators too. I'm sorry um, that we have to end it here, but thank you all very, very much indeed. And thank, thank you, you so to the much. Institute again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful to see you all. Gemma, yes. adieu. 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 <laughs> Carol, nice to hear you, Manuel. Thank you, Mark. Great Thank to hear. You. Great to hear you, Manuel and Anna. Your translations, wonderful. Yes. Same here. I really love those translations you did of Gemma's. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If it's all up to you, because if I hadn't read your anthology, it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> <laughs> Excellent. 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 Excellent.